This morning, we are going to be in John chapter 2, the Gospel of John chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Also, in your program, you'll find an outline where you can uh, follow along in the message if that is something you'd like to do. As today, we enter into a message about Jesus' first public miracle. I want to start with a little story that begins in March of 2004. And at that time, dozens of rescuers were looking for 39 Boy Scouts and their leaders who were trapped by tons of snow. An avalanche in the high country of Utah's Logan Canyon had covered the Scouts. 64 mile an hour winds made rescue efforts extremely difficult. Now ironically, the trapped Scouts slept comfortably throughout the entire ordeal. The group had carved deep snow caves the night before, bunkering in. And so when the avalanche occurred around 4 a.m., the sleepers inside had no idea that they were buried under six to eight feet of snow. The snow caves insulated the group from sound and wind and even the knowledge that they were in trouble at all. You're pretty cozy inside of them, said Randy Maurer, the father of one of the scouts. You're completely oblivious to what's going on on the outside. Well, thankfully, two of the scout leaders were not in the snow caves. They were sleeping in a trailer nearby. They heard the storm. They witnessed the avalanche. And they called for emergency help. The sheriff who responded said, that probably made quite a bit of noise. But if all of them had been in the caves, I shudder to think how long it would have been before we would have even heard about this. But instead, rescuers quickly found the scout's location by jabbing probes down into the snow, waking them to the news that they'd been rescued from a danger that they knew nothing about. Well, today we're entering into a a story from the Gospel of John. It's one of the more famous accounts in the Bible, and it involves a, a young couple that need a rescue. And likewise, they have no idea the rescue is called for. And so while they enjoy the afterglow of their wedding ceremony, Jesus is organizing a rescue party for their reception. In our text today, John features an event from the early ministry of Jesus that demonstrates his power and his authority. We're witness to a miraculous sign as Jesus exercises his creative power to turn water into wine. The event demonstrates that Jesus was the fullness of God, clothed in humanity. I'd like to read that gospel account, John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to Jesus, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to. Well, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water, that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. 
Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. It's quite an account, isn't it? A little bit of a historical background. Cana was a very small village. And so the wedding was no doubt a community-wide event. Everyone of note in Cana was likely there, as were friends and family members from neighboring villages like Nazareth. And so Jesus and his mother Mary and some of his disciples were at this wedding as well. The wedding seemed to be going well. Everyone was probably having a great time until a crisis arises. Now, in Jesus' day, running out of wine at a wedding reception was not just a mild faux pas. It was considered extremely rude to the guests who had attended the wedding, bearing gifts for the new couple. In fact, it was more than rude. It was so offensive, so much so that there there are actual records from the first century, the time of Jesus, telling about families who were sued for running out of wine at a wedding. That's not a joke, that's real. And so the wedding families found themselves facing an embarrassment and potentially threatening situation, both socially and legally, because, as John writes, the wine was gone. And when the wine gave out, that is when Mary turned to Jesus. So this brings us to our our first point today. And that is, we can ask Jesus anything. We can ask anything of Jesus. They have no more wine, she told him. Well, isn't that often when, when we turn to God? We turn to God when we run out of something. When we run out of strength, when we run out of money, when we run out of options. We turn to the Lord when we run out of passion, when we've run out of patience, when we run out of perseverance. We turn to God when we run out of hope, when we run out of joy. We turn to God when we are feeling beat up and burned out. We We turn to God when the game is up, when our sin has found us out, when we realize that we are helpless. We turn to God when the the gauge of our emotional and psychological tank is way past that red line marked E for empty. We turn to God when we realize we need help. When we see that our sins and our habits and our addictions and our self-destructive behavior is harmful to ourselves and to others. When we hit rock bottom, we turn to God when we run out of something. I believe that's what Mary is modeling here. The good news of the gospel is that God meets us when we run out. That God meets us in the place of our need. And that's what Jesus shows us here at the wedding. Even though at first it didn't look like it would go that way. When Mary speaks to Jesus and tells him the wine has run out, Jesus initially replies, woman, why do you involve me? My time's not yet come. It might appear to us that Jesus is being rude or short with his mother. Addressing his mother as woman. And yet in Jesus' day, that expression was one of affection. It's not that Jesus didn't care about the wine running out. It's that he knew that he'd come for a different purpose. He knew that his time had not yet come. And yet, Jesus cared. He cared about 
the wine running out. He didn't say, good, I'm glad it ran out. You shouldn't be drinking wine anyway. (laughs) Jesus didn't reprove the wedding families for poor planning. How could you not purchase enough wine? Jesus didn't chastise the people for drinking too much. But Jesus would indeed do something. In fact, I, I, I believe that Mary knew that he would do something because in, in spite of Jesus' initial response, what is her response? She says to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. It's Mother's Day. Jesus listened to his mom, didn't he? We can ask anything of Jesus. We can ask him. It's his desire that we come to him with our requests. But when we come to ask, we also must be aware that along with our request, we must be prepared to yield everything. That's the second point of the message today. We must yield everything. Now remember, this is no ordinary mother-son conversation. This is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, he is dealing with the mother. The mother who was visited by angels. Who knows who he is. This is the Son of God. And so when Jesus says, my time has not yet come, Mary doesn't question it. Instead, she says to those servants, do whatever he says. Whatever. You see, she is willing to ask anything, but she is also willing to yield everything. I'll ask for what I want, but I will yield to Jesus because he knows what is best and what is right. Mary recognized that Jesus knows what's best and right. He knows in exact proportion of what is needed. They needed some wine. But when Jesus does this miracle, it's done virtually in secret. The master of the feast, the MC of the ceremonies, if you will, doesn't know what's going on. And so when the wine is brought that Jesus has changed, it says explicitly, he did not know where it came from. Apparently the guests don't know either. Who is it that knows? The servants and Jesus' disciples. And as a result, John concludes his recording of this particular event by saying that the disciples believed in him. They believed, and as a result, they are the ones who must now fulfill what they're called to do because they believe in him. Which leads me to ask the question, what would it mean for us today if we were willing to ask anything, but also to yield everything? Often our temptation is to think we're we're dealing with the Son of God who can bring down lightning and can create earthquakes on demand. Perhaps we not better trouble him with the little stuff. But do you remember what the Apostle Paul taught in Philippians 4? He he said this, he wrote, In everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. In everything. Later, after this event in the Gospel of John, Jesus was teaching his disciples, how to pray. Some of these very same disciples who were at that wedding. And you might remember when he taught them to pray, part of that prayer was, yet Lord, not my will, but thine be done. 
We must yield everything. There are no things too small for Jesus. We can bring him a wedding embarrassment. We can bring him our family embarrassments and our weakness and our pain and our trouble and the things that we think are beneath him because they're due to our guilt and our shame and our rebellion. But Jesus says, ask me anything. And as you do, yield everything. Acknowledge that it's my will, not yours. My proportion, not yours. My timing, not yours. It's the king of heaven who will now take things over if we put it into his hands. But we have to let his hands do the work. Do whatever he says, Mary instructed. You know, our problem is we ask for what we want, but then we do whatever we feel. We do what we think is best instead of yielding everything. We can ask for anything, but we must yield everything because when we do, we can then know we are completely cared for. We are completely cared for. Now, I believe that many of you in this room know this story well. Jesus provides a great quantity of wine. You recognize here that there are those six stone jars mentioned in verse 6. They were for the, the Jewish rites of purification. Each of them held 20 to 30 gallons. And so one thing we learn here is that Jesus, he just gives a lot of what is needed. But it's, it's more than just the quantity of wine that's mentioned. It's really the quality that is emphasized. I think there are a couple of reasons for this. One of the reasons is because in Jewish custom, the provision of wine was a sign of the provision of blessing from God. Those were tied together. Now, as we read the story, the focus for many of us is the, the master, the wine steward, the, the master of the feast who says, you know, usually when, when people have had too much to drink, they don't care anymore. Then the bad wine comes out, but this is the best wine, and you're serving it last. But I, I want us to see that it, it's not just how good the wine is, but where it is coming from. You know, those jars that Jesus had filled with water, what were they used for? Purification, for washing, for cleansing. It's very important in Jewish culture as these people entered into a house or into a wedding ceremony or into any event that they would undergo external washing. But it's as if Jesus is saying, you've used this for external cleansing, but I want to give you something that is internal. You know, there will be a night not very much farther down the road for Jesus when he lifts a cup of wine and he says to his disciples, this cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it. Why? Because when we follow Jesus, we will be purified what he will ultimately provide. His blood. His sacrifice for our souls for our well-being it is the internal purification that's being signaled and signified so that as God's people we will move beyond hoping for just external things 
And as we are hoping for something more eternal, more changing, more lasting, we can have hope. Because we're not just dependent on the externals. We have something far more significant. We are completely cared for when we are in a relationship with Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And the care that Jesus extends is so much more than the simple mundane things of this world. He is focused on caring for us into eternity. That is his goal. That is his purpose. And so when we come to ask anything, and when we are ready to yield everything, it is then that Jesus can say to us, you are completely cared for. Even in a a fallen world full of heartache and disappointment and suffering and failure surrounding us. God's business is joy. Do you trust him to do that business for you? You know, I think if Jesus had a business card back in the day, it might just have read, Jesus Christ, wedding planner. Yeah, he's in the grace business, absolutely, and he's in the joy business. But really, this Jesus, he is in the wedding business. Many years after John wrote his gospel and recorded for us this historic first public miracle, he wrote in another important work that is included in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And in that book, God gives John a vision of the future and the return of Jesus. Jesus, the wedding planner. Listen to these words from Revelation chapter 21. The words of John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Wow. At the end of days, all the peoples who have trusted in Jesus will come together. There will be a great feast A great wedding feast of the Lamb. And at this great wedding feast, what will happen? The people of God, the new Jerusalem, will come down from heaven adorned as a bride. And at that point, God will wipe away every tear. You see, Jesus is in the wedding business. He is the ultimate wedding planner. And what he is doing in this earliest of miracles is to show who he really is and what he will really do for you and for me. Jesus says, if you will ask anything of me and truly yield everything to me, then my intention is to provide everything that you need in this life Everything you need to be rid of sin and shame and guilt and heartache. So that we can be wed to him forever. And in that wedding of one so dear, one so close, so powerful, there can be an eternal life with him. So that 
when the things of this earth, as the old hymn says, grow strangely dim, as hard as they have been, our hearts will continue to rejoice because we recognize the one who has vowed to us, the one who is in the wedding business, whether in sickness or health, plenty or want, sin or shame. He says, you are mine, both now and forever. We are completely cared for. He is the wedding planner. And his plan is for you to join him in this eternal journey. A journey that extends beyond the stuff of this life. So often our focus is on work and bills and soccer practice and doctor visits and cleaning the house and mowing the grass and just doing the stuff. We need to be rescued. And sometimes we don't even know it. But Jesus is inviting us to rise above the common, the mundane, into a relationship that is eternal, one in which we will be fully his people and he will be with us forever. Will you ask him? Will you yield to him? Will you be completely cared for? Let's pray together.